today's show, we have our guest, David Gola. And we're going to be talking about people who feel marginalized in society. Maybe some people feel different. Maybe they have a physical disability or a mental disability. Is there a place in the faith for them? Or perhaps they're part of the LGBT community. What spiritual advice do you have for these particular individuals? Or perhaps there's an individual out there who has a criminal background or feels they have pursued wrong things in this life. Is there a place in the faith for them? David Gould? Well, it's a, it's a curious matter. Um, lots of human beings have a sense, if not all human beings, a sense of their own limitations, a sense of missteps, a sense that they don't quite fit in. Uh, when we look at Jesus Christ, what do we see? We see him not spending his time with your regular churchgoers, not spending his time with people that live right, do everything properly. He's spending his time with prostitutes, with tax collectors, with people that have various disabilities, with people who have a deep sense of uh, failure, with people that are accused. Um, I can't think of any gospel narrative where Jesus Christ is spending time with people that do not feel themselves to some extent marginalized. Even if they're people of power, uh, such as a tax collector in that period, who you would think would have some kind of power. But certainly within the Jewish community, they felt marginalized because they were representatives of the state. We can think about that question, uh, Vladimir. We can think about it as, is there room in the faith for them? Or does the faith have, have something to invite them into? Or we can think of it, is there room in the church? Does the church invite them? And these are quite different questions. Um, certainly, Jesus Christ makes it very clear that he came not for the righteous. They don't need him. He came for what is called sinners, that lovely term in Hebrew and Greek which really refers to those people that have a sense that they have somehow missed the mark of life, a sense of their own falling short, a sense that they maybe haven't fulfilled their life the way in which they had hoped or the way in which others had hoped for them. So in a sense, the Christian faith itself is, is rooted in, in that feeling. You see, that feeling is the surfacing of humility. When people feel that way, the best part of that is that they're beginning to engage a certain kind of humility. And that humility is seen as a singular value. It's the kind of gateway to coming close to the creator of all that is. People who are proud, people who are convinced that they have done everything right, people who are, in the sense of the words of Jesus Christ, righteous, They don't have that. 
sense of humility. They have not come up to the gateway of drawing near to God because the way they've constructed the world is adequate for them. So we have this figure, you mentioned her to me earlier, of uh, Maria Paris. Uh, she was canonized in the Orthodox Church by the Ecumenical Patriarch, uh, if I recall correctly, back in 2006 or 2004. This is a remarkable human being. She was born in Russia prior to uh, the turn of the century, that is the turn of the 20th century. And so uh, she grew up in Imperial Russia. Uh, she really grew up uh, as a uh, a remarkable young woman, very bright, very eager, very concerned, always with the poor. Uh, she became, uh, for all intents and purposes, a communist and was part of that early group of Russian intellectuals, which involved many of the great Russian intellectuals who became socialists or communists of one form or another. And that's because they had seen the decadence of the imperial system in Russia. They had seen also, perhaps most precisely, the terrible decadence within the Russian Orthodox Church. That it had become preoccupied with itself instead of being preoccupied with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So one of the main forms of atheism, I mean one of the main ways in which atheism becomes important is really at the hands of the church. When the church turns inward, becomes preoccupied with itself and its own power, and is no longer really the bride of Jesus Christ, is no longer helping people understand and bearing witness to the fact that divine love is at the center of life. So it was not surprising that that was her way of understanding things, given the conditions at the time. She was married, relatively short marriage, divorced. She remarried, uh, had a child, several children. And she herself, when her, her little girl died, uh, she began to take a journey to uh, draw near to God, the creator of all that is. What is remarkable about her, I suppose, is that through that process and through her entrance into, into the church, she retained deep focus on the second commandment. You know, the lawyer comes to Jesus Christ and says, what is the whole of the law? And Jesus Christ quotes, of course, from the Torah, the whole of the law is to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then the lawyer asks, and is there a second? And the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. These two commandments are intimately interconnected. They cannot be separated. They are as intimate as the two natures of Jesus Christ, his human and his divine nature. If you separate them, you destroy it. And I think uh, Maria of Paris had such a vivid sense of that. So she worked her whole life with the poor, whether it was with uh, stevedores in Marseille, whether it was, was with uh, iron workers in the Pyrenees Mountains, uh, on the streets of Paris, whether it was going out at two o'clock in the morning and finding people living on the street and inviting them home. She is uh, an early example of what we also see in the great Roman Catholic saint, I think she's a saint, Dorothy Day in the United States, who lived a very similar kind of life. So these two remarkable human beings 
uh, bear witness to us of what the fullness of the gospel means. And when you draw near to God's grace, when your life becomes one with what we in the Orthodox Church would call the energy of the Holy Spirit, how you then live. You live a life of such remarkable attentiveness to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, as it says in Matthew 25. She really lives out Matthew 25 in a remarkable way. And of course, the struggle in Russia, she saw what happened with the, the decadence, as I mentioned, in the old Tsarist period of the church, the decadence which came, became even as grave, if not graver, under the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, and the way in which the church engages in its kind of colonization, self-colonization. And of course we're faced with that now, also. Terrible situation within the church and its relationship to the state at this point. You refer to the war in Ukraine right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a horrific matter, and I can't imagine that uh, if she was with us, she would be uh, speaking a very, very sharp word uh, in this particular moment. And then, of course, she is arrested uh, by the Germans in the Nazi period and ends up uh, in uh, Ravensbrück, the concentration camp, and sent to the gas chamber. The bit we have of her time when she was in, in the, uh, the death camp, um, she was quite a good embroiderer, and she embroidered icons. And she embroidered an icon of, of the Theotokos, uh, the birth giver of God, holding the infant Jesus Christ. And hold, and, no, pardon me, holding Jesus Christ on a cross. So it's this remarkable sense of the birth giver of God, the Theotokos, who's the icon of our, our human vocation, the one who gives birth to divine love in the world, and of Jesus Christ, who takes up the cross, and instead of passing on the agony, takes the agony upon himself, and out of whose death and resurrection uh, we see the redemption of, of human beings. And that includes, of course, the redemption which she lived which led her to live a life of service, a life serving the least of these, my brothers and sisters in the world, as Jesus Christ says in Matthew 25. So she's a remarkable example. And I suppose she scandalized a number of people because she didn't wrap, dress in the usual fashion, and she certainly didn't behave in the usual fashion. But there is a big lesson in that. It was said she would. You could see her in bars drinking a beer and having a cigarette. Sure. And she would just talk politics with people. And sure. She was quite eccentric in that way. Yeah. Well, she would talk politics and she would talk about the faith. Yep. She would talk about human passions and and the redemptive grace to be found in Jesus Christ. So. Um, it's so odd when you think of how so many churches are made up of middle-class people who uh, have about the same income, live in similar kind of houses, and their life patterns are about the same. Uh, but of course, that's a peculiar, a very peculiar phenomenon. Um, if you look at both Jesus Christ and the history of the church uh, in a rich way, you see that uh, the way of uh, Jesus Christ is, is the way of engaging, engaging deeply with everyone in the life of the world. Because every human being, no matter what 
they have done, no matter how they are, every human being is the image of God. They are the image of God. So you mentioned people with particular kinds of difficulties. Those difficulties are not are not at the center of how Jesus Christ calls us to respond. He calls us to respond, and we are given the grace to respond to others for who they are. They are the image of God, suffering human beings with their passions just like we are. So we're called into friendship. We're called into a deep fellowship with everyone in the life of the world.